Live, baby. All the way live. All the way. <laughs> see? I <don't> worry. <laughs> well, see, I, I have a different song for that little what you do. Because mine's like a baby. punk rock ska song. <laughs> so I doubt we're on the same one. No. Um, <laughs> Oh, no, hip hop. Well, yeah, but oh, you know what? That's probably what they're referencing. Yeah. We live, everybody. Hey, everybody! Welcome to the Vertical Church podcast. Uh, just some of the vertical pastors today gathering to just talk about. <laughs> what? <laughs> fake thug. Oh, fake DJ. Thug. <laughs> yes, Game DJ. Bang. DJ is our resident fake thug. Um, <laughs> Just don't push because it. real killers move in silence. Yeah. Um, just don't push it. Um, pray, pray with me. Don't play with me. Um, but uh, we're here today. We're going to be discussing uh, some stuff out of the story of Abraham, uh, and overall, just some stuff we pulled from this. Because uh, when we talked, said that we were going to be preaching on Abraham, were you like excited about that? Because I feel like we've done that recently. Like, I was excited about it actually. I, I enjoy the, the book of Genesis, just that and Exodus. I mean, it's just the thing I like about the Old Testament is, man, the the application just it flows right out of the text. I mean, mm-hmm. there's not a lot of extra work that has to be done pulling stuff out. I mean, it's you're telling yeah. a story, it's a narrative, and mm-hmm. and I think it relates to where we are, even though it's thousands of years ago. I mean, the human <laughs> condition is the same. Yeah, yes. no matter where you are. So. Sin but it doesn't change over time. No, it doesn't. But uh, the thing, the, the great thing is that we don't have to work to pull a ton out. But the reality is, there's still so much about Jesus, like just as we're That's going through sure. there. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> the, hidden, the hidden secrets of Jesus found yeah. throughout the Old Testament. The crimson cord. Yeah, crimson yeah. cord. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, so. <laughs> Going through this, because I know we all sometimes we always learn things uh, as we go through Scripture. Was there anything you actually learned or pulled from this that you may not have noticed beforehand? Something that we learned, mm-hmm. or just something that just jumped out to you about the text? You know, going through Abraham's whole story ahead of time. I'd say for me, how Abraham twice uh, threw his wife under the bus, saying, "Hey, just tell him you're my sister." <laughs> Like, not once, but twice. Yeah. And almost lost his wife, and God still protected him through it. Well, and, and that's the thing, too, like, uh, with the sister thing. And this this is something I learned this go-round. You know, maybe I'd re- I know I've read it before because I've read the Bible before, but I think I learned it this go-round, is that Sarah was technically his sister. Yep. Yep. Half-sister. <laughs> Half-sister. 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 So yeah. he half-lied, you know. He, which, remember, is a, which is an all-the-way lie. Which is <laughs> A half lie is uh, a half truth is a whole lie, um, yeah. Ooh. Uh, oh, and my comment that yeah, um, <laughs> but he lied about that. And but the reality is, I'm just thinking about this situation. I get that you don't want to get like killed or whatever, <laughs> and you know that for this was in that Old Testament era where uh, eighty wasn't eighty. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Like yeah. that. This woman was attractive enough over a twenty-year window in her <laughs> senior citizen days to be put into two different like leaders' harems. Yeah. yeah. Um, she must have been a real looker. That's what I'm just saying. I was just like, you see some people that age ridiculously well now. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But this had to be on some biblical, yeah. um, unprecedentedness. Hey, Joe McDaniel. Um, miss you, dude. Um, Joe McDaniel in the house. What? Uh, but Sarah had to be some kind of special that, like, he's like, listen, I know they're going to want you, so roll with that. And it's just like, that just weirds me out that that's your, that's your option. <laughs> and it's not like, all right, I'm going to fight for you. Yeah. Or, like, you know. No, no fight. No fight, anything. He's just like, I'm going to go ahead and hand you well, over. Well, to Abraham's credit, I mean, it's just him and his little entourage against the whole nation of Egypt and Pharaoh who, you know, is a is a world power at this time. So well, another part is he didn't have to go there. Well, he didn't. He could have. He could have <laughs> so, continued to trust God where he was at. So yeah. he, I mean, he done that on his own. Yeah. Well, that's part of the problem, right? Yeah. He got off of God's path. So, but so you brought that up about the repeat, repeated sister thing. Um, yeah. Um, and the truth was that she was his sister, and that was a valid point. Air quotes, you know, even in a half truth. Yeah. But what cracks me up, and we were reading it in our small group time this week, um, Isaac 
did the same thing. Did the same thing, <laughs> did the same thing with Rebecca. <laughs> yeah. But she's a hundred percent not his sister. Yeah. Yeah. Generational lies. Like she's straight up like a distant cousin of yeah. Abraham. Yeah. But she was not his sister. And I'm just like did he just come up with that and that's a generational thing? Do you think he was like, that was sitting around having, you know, like, you know, son, one time I said, that's my, your mom, my sister. And like, just like, <laughs> yeah, told one of those crazy stories or like, do you, how do you think he got to that point? I think the sins of the father follow uh, <laughs> into the son. But, it's not uh, like he didn't hear. He had to hear about what Abraham had done. Well, maybe that was a thing then. Not just for Abraham. Maybe other people did. It was like, okay, we're going to go to this place. Uh, you're my sister. You're not my wife, so we can live. It's just, yeah. it's just wrong in a lot of ways. <laughs> Let's just I want to know what she was thinking. <laughs> yeah. Like, you're just using me. You wanted me to do what? <laughs> I mean, because here's the reality. Is, and I'm going I'm to bring this up in a second. When, they, when she got uh, passed off, literally anything could have happened to her. Right. Yeah. Anything. Because like, she's like, Fine. I am a man who will fight for your honor. Obviously not. <laughs> yeah. well, not dude, fight uh, for honor. So there's this account in um in Genesis as we're well, as we're dealing with Isaac's end of it, where um the guy ended up praying, uh the king Abimelech, right? Mm -hmm. Abimelech was like <laughs> Abimelech when he found it, he's like, God <laughs> by my integrity right. and yeah. my honor. I did not touch this woman. I did nothing. You've yeah. seen it, Lord. You've seen it. <laughs> Lord, you've seen it. Yeah. And well, I mean, to that also, Pharaoh had honor in the fact that he was yeah. obviously not wanting to take another man's wife. Yeah. Yeah. Which you would have that's that's speaks something to Pharaoh that kind of surprised me. I mean, when you don't think of, you don't think about it a lot, but you like yeah. the fact that he had integrity enough, you know, even though he was not a worshiper of God. And he could have any woman. But he, he could have any woman that he want. That he he had many wives, and so yeah, I guess he had a lot point, of he, to he, you know, he had a integrity. <laughs> I'm not gonna it's not time here. He had the integrity yeah. of the sanctity of marriage. I mean, when you declare marriage versus concubines, right? Mm. He could have gave him a concubine, probably would have been, but your wife. Yeah. It's, it's special about that relationship. It's and even he recognized yeah. it, uh, even though he was even a pagan king. Yeah, recognized pagan king. The, the the special nature of in the you know of the, the sanctity of marriage, marriage. yeah hmm. yeah which shows how far our world has come today that we don't even see it that, that well, big a deal but what's that also say about abraham that he was willing to like throw a hail mail mary with her twice <laughs> like i'm once, gonna throw you in <laughs> i'm gonna throw you into this and hope you come back home well, i think that just speaks to how how great how powerful fear is yeah how, mm -hmm. how powerful fear, fear is a powerful motivator <laughs> And obviously he was fearful of what was going to yeah, happen. Yeah, I mean, he just threw all over the way like it was life and his wife. Ooh. Yeah. So on that note, um, <laughs> Abraham straight up threw Sarah to the wolves two times. <laughs> Isaac threw Rebecca to the wolves. Um, what are the things in your lives and that we see in the lives of others that sometimes we are willing to sacrifice to protect ourselves? Mm. What are the things that actually matter in your life that you're willing to throw out to keep you from getting taken down? Hmm. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be like that family feud. You know, so I'm, I'm, I'm not hitting the button. No. <laughs> that's a hard Good that's, answer. Good yeah, answer. Wow. I think for me, one thing I have to, like, uh, what's the word? Fight against is, like, whether it's, sharing the gospel or saying something that I think I need to say like I feel the fear of like what are they going to think about me and there's been times that I've copped out because of that fear of like what would they think about me or mm -hmm. that that's a very conflicting situation and then there's other times I was able to just go for and do it but that'd be one situation is like how people see me is one one fear sometimes that comes up mm -hmm. perception yeah can you restate the question what are the, what are some things you are willing to sacrifice in your life to protect yourself like that you're willing to throw in front of it and like um you know what mike brought up the fact that you know not he's more willing to preserve yourself sometimes than actually have hard conversations um when i was at that comic-con this weekend there was somebody that was very passionate about a character that i'm very passionate about 
And I know I have a Bible study about it, but I also know this person didn't ask about a Bible study. And so I'm like, I could really connect with you on this topic right now, but I don't want to be pushy. And I let her walk away. Mm-hmm. And then like, and as soon as she walked away, it caught me like, ah, I shouldn't have let her walk away. I threw, like, I straight up threw mm-hmm. my comfort and my like, I don't want to be the bad guy uh, no. a way to do that. And then uh, eventually, like, I caught myself like leaning over the table, looking around the corner, like, "Please come back, lady." Like, I hope because yeah. like there's like a thousand people here. I'm yeah. like, "Hopes, I hope you come." Back. She did, and then we connected, and like a hundred percent, the conversation I thought could happen mm. happened, wow. and it invested well. But I was I was willing to yeah. throw away for a, a God ordained appointment mm. Mm. for comfort. Well, I think we've all done that at some point in time where we've oh, the yeah. fear of you know what they might think of you or you know how they might react or what that conversation might evolve into that you're like eh. well if i mess it up yeah. yeah i'm just willing to to stay comfortable and not not yeah, do that. yeah it's a it, and to me personally it's a, a a fear sometime of of how to lead conversations to a spiritual conversation without mm. being that freakish person that they, 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 they yeah. no longer want to be around you now because yeah. Every time you're going to you try to lead it to that, yeah. you know, that conversation of, yeah. but we have to do that at some point. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. what we're called to do. We're, we're called to try yeah. to lead those appointments to those spiritual conversations to where we can kind of find out where they are and let them know where you are yeah. spiritually. But it, it's awkward. Yeah. It's awkward. Like you said, it's comfort. Mm-hmm. We, we, can, we, can, we can just stay in that comfort zone of just having those surface level kinds of conversations with people and, and not really get deep, especially if it, it's not someone you're around a lot. If you're mm-hmm. around someone a lot, you can kind of lead that way. But someone you see very seldom, like, Hector, that was a true time point. you know, this <laughs> probably time. never see this person, you know, never again, maybe. God said you ain't getting out of here. And it, had to, and it had to lead that way because he felt, and I've done that many times, it's like, oh, that was a door that was open. Yeah. And, and I let it close. Mm. So we're willing to sacrifice what is right, what is true, what is good sometimes for what is comfortable or what is Scared. causing us to be fearful. Self-preservation. Yeah. 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 Um, and I know, and this is no shade or knock or say this, but I know you and I have talked and we talked to the staff and you mentioned this morning that like, you know, about <coughs> the building stuff is like, you're just, you didn't want to have to invest more time into putting building yeah, and construction and stuff like that. I got um, burned out in building and construction. Yeah. After a built after a renovation through the summer and then a flood. <laughs> yeah. Um, which is understandable. <laughs> have there ever been times where you have known that God had given you an opportunity um, and you just didn't do it because it was too much work? Mm. Has there ever been an, a time where you'll throw uh, something God's given us out the door like Sarah, like Abraham through Sarah because it's just too much work to do? Hmm. Oh, sure. Yeah, definitely. Um, I hate to say it that, like that's so easy to say, but yeah. yeah. I, thought, I thought we weren't getting deep today. Ah, uh, you <laughs> failed. <laughs> well, we just we started off with this off the topic. Hey, Philip. Um, well, it's like uh, you know, so Jordan uh, Jacobs has been going to you know visit another church for like a college thingy or you know yeah. worship thingy, and he'll come back with a lot of ideas sometimes, and um. He hit me up, you know, maybe three months ago. He's like, hey, for our announcement slides on Sunday morning, instead of just having pictures, can you turn them into videos and just, just, just and do it? And I was just like, <laughs> and I was like, I, and everything in me was like, I don't want to do that. Yeah. It's a lot more work. Yeah. And, um, but the reality is I think some of the, um, some of the best opportunities are the stuff that we don't feel comfortable doing in our own strength. Mm-hmm. Um, because you know when we actually have to push beyond our comfort zones and our abilities to do stuff I think that's when we actually find like the fruit of it because it's you know if we do things within our own strength that's usually you know I can do this without wearing myself out right and then sometimes the stuff that will push us beyond that is where God actually works yeah. um, you know, with stuff like that, you know, we, uh, 
we're about to do an announcement on Sunday and Monday for a mission trip opportunity. And, you know, most most people they hear mission trip, they're like, oh, that's time off work. That's, you know, I could be at the lake, I could be at the vacation, I could do whatever else. And even in making the video to make the announcement, it's just like, we had, you know, a bunch of stuff over this week. You know, Tuesday was a long day. We we had all these things. And so, you know, Lyric got up with me and they're like, all right, let's, let's film this video. And I'm like, oh, I don't want to. <laughs> um, and um, I, I just think that there's been times where we'll throw, we'll not only throw out a God opportunity for our comfort, we'll throw out a God opportunity because it actually requires us to give more than we're comfortable with. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and I, I just know that there's good stuff on the other side of that. You know, I didn't, I don't know how it, it came that I became a, vision moment writer but when it first was said hey can you put this together it was like I would I would think and worry about it all week how am I gonna do this what am I gonna do and and it was really like I want to give this away can can somebody else do this and I was trying to do that in my own strength mm -hmm. going okay what am I gonna do how am um, how am I gonna put this together where other people understand what I'm thinking versus now I, I really see it as an opportunity. It gives me another chance to study in, in doing something and, and creating a, a little, you know, two, three minute talk versus, you know, who was it? Uh, one of my former pastors would call him sermonettes. He, he would just, <clears throat> God breathed, and it was just a little short thing that would maybe touch someone. Mm -hmm. And I had to view it that way that God, okay, pray about it okay here's the idea for this week god lead me there instead of for three or four days getting all nervous and and thinking about what am i going to do how am i going to do this and then as people i see different people give those vision talks that that i've written down i kind of got oh they didn't say this and they didn't say that and i went through all the trouble of making the right words <laughs> and go well what's the point of this or you don't do it all together it's, it's the vision. Or we just wing it and do something. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's what are we doing at this point to show yeah. the vision yeah. in this moment for, for understanding where we are, what we're about, and what we're about to do mm. as far as the message that's coming, to try to combine that. And, and it's just like God spoke to me and says, it's okay. I speak to them too. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Well, in their own personality, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The way they would say it. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. usually, in, and because <laughs> uh, especially when our vision moments, like the stuff in between, is a little bit longer, like yeah. it's like I like I can't process all that that fast to say, right. but it's like I'll <clears throat> I'll be ministered to, and I'll get something from what was written, yeah. and then something else comes out of me from it. Mm -hmm. um, and but that that's one of the things too often is like so often we'll get to the place where we'll know God is giving us an opportunity, but we just straight up say, "Well, I didn't. I know I did this for you, Lord, but I didn't get the reward I wanted out of it. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to stop." Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and the the the, co <laughs> the the cold reality of it is, if you're doing it for God, and you need a reward, yeah. you're not no, doing it for God. Yeah. Um, you not got the right heart. Mm -mm. Sure. I think like when we did the, uh, I mean, we're still doing it. When we did the Halloween thing with the city, <coughs> like after doing it the first couple of years, it's like, okay, what is, what are we getting from it as a church? You know, when in reality, at the end of the day, it's about us being used to bless. Giving, our, giving ourselves away. Yeah. And uh, yeah. I think we had to make that turn as a church because that's a lot of work. We had to make a turn as a staff. Yeah. I mean, and that's a. Well, you're like, you know, like I don't, I know we're on camera, but I don't think nobody has ever came to church from Halloween event. Has it? You all know what? Not that I'm aware of. Not, not that, that I'm aware, aware of. of. But know. it's not like not it's sure. dramatically changed our church landscape because of doing it. Right. Outside of us yielding to what you just said of us giving ourselves away. Yeah. You know. Well, it's the, you give yourself away. You can't out right. give God. God gives back to you in different ways. Yeah. yeah. Well, I've been a part of ministries in the past, both and not that they were wrong or that they were failing. It's just I've been a part of ministries in the past where they'll will literally look at um, our desired goal 
yeah. and say, if this isn't yielding the return on investment, <laughs> right. they will quit. Then we're quitting it. Mm -hmm. um, now, here's the thing. Every good idea is not a God idea. Yeah. And sometimes we have ideas as leaders and church folks that it's a great idea, but it might be more demanding than it actually is fruitful. Right. But there's a difference between me having a good idea versus I know God's told me to do something. Right. right. Um, yeah. uh, and, and that's the thing. The reality is like we, we have to learn to be able to say, if I know God's leading in it, to push past that. So we'll push past our, we'll throw our own comfort in the way, mm -hmm. or we'll throw obedience in the way to keep us from actually to having to be uncomfortable. We'll throw uh, a, a good work of God out of in the way to be able to actually have to do the extra work. Um, on the flip side, let's, let's invert that last one. Um, has there been times you've ever thrown your own uh, well-being or your family's well-being in the way of doing a project or church or work where you've sacrificed your family in a way or that you didn't need to because you weren't willing to let up? I've tried to keep that balance. I mean, I have learned from pastors in my hmm. As a, as a lay person as I've watched their lives and as they poured into me um, I've tried to make sure that I don't do that I don't want to sacrifice my family for ministry I mean I tried to keep a balance I've tried to include my family in the ministry process um, and not make it something that I'm doing and taking time away from them yeah. um, I don't know I guess you'd have to ask my kids if, if, if that's been beneficial <coughs> or if I've succeeded in that Mm -hmm. um, but I've tried not to I've tried not to do that with my wife and well maybe probably my wife has been sacrificed a little bit maybe through that probably more so than the kids right. um, because she's a pastor's wife but uh, she's also a servant heart so I don't know how much of that she did just because she's a server or because mm -hmm. she felt like she had to so again I guess we'd have to ask her about that <laughs> I mean because and I think that's one of the things is that uh we were talking about with Abraham and Sarah, the fact that the stuff that Sarah went through happened because Abraham went further in a direction than God had told him to go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. And I think there's sometimes where we we'll, we will make something seem like a priority to ourselves and we'll act like it's a God ordained thing. And our families usually end up suffering with it. Mm -hmm. um, so and, the key there is to make sure it's a God ordained thing <laughs> and not a me thing. Yeah. You really have to check your pride in that. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> and then that's the thing, too. When, when we find out that we're doing this stuff and we're pushing ourselves because it's something we feel compelled to do or, or like, it's a requirement, you know, from ourselves, then it really just does become taxing on everybody else involved. Yeah. You know? I think, too, like Donnie said, there. I mean, you do try to keep the balance, but there are, there are busy seasons. You know, like I remember sure. remodeling Pembroke and then transitioning to Bladen and then went right back into remodeling at Bladen. While, while you're remodeling your house. <laughs> yeah. And uh, <laughs> those were some, I mean, those were some tough weeks, man. Um, and I think my wife and I, I mean, we, we have date night every week or try to, to the best of our ability. We, we make it a priority, but one day doesn't, one day doesn't uh, fulfill a whole week's, you know, and as Donnie said, I think balance is key. But when your to-do list outweighs your uh, time to do it, yeah, you have to <laughs> you have to put some stuff in yeah in perspective. Well, there's always going to be seasons, and yeah. you know, that's where we've got to give each other grace. Yeah, um, just make sure you don't make that a habit. Right. Um, where it's like that every week, which is sometimes we get in that cycle, and it's like we don't we don't know where to stop. And we just keep going. That's where you can get in trouble for sure. I'm learning how to say no. Yeah, that's that's key. Well, for learning me. how to say no and to set boundaries yeah. um, for your life and um, say no for the right reasons. Yeah, yeah. learning how to utilize other boundaries. people is a key for me, which is so hard. Now, I'm in scripture. I don't rec I don't see a place. Do you see any place that we saw in scripture where Sarah or Rebecca in these contexts? argued that case of like hey let's not do this 
Mm -hmm. I don't think so. I don't, I don't really see that. Yeah. Um, except in the case of when Isaac was wanting to give the birthright to Esau. Yeah. <laughs> then, yeah. Then Rebecca stepped in and said, no, that's, that's, yeah. let's do it this way. And rather doing it God's way, she manipulated the situation. So. Yeah. so on that thing of, you know, making sure we don't go in the, the wrong direction or throw, throw our family to the wolves at the sake of, uh, of ministry, I think one of the big things is being able to learn to listen to what our family needs. Hmm. Um, and the people in our lives, what they need, and keeping an ear out for that. Because um, have you ever been on a road trip with your family or anybody, and like somebody said, "I got to use the bathroom," and you're like, "Well, how long can you hold it?" Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. 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 <laughs> that's. Are you busting at the seams, or have you got a got a little bit yeah. of margin there? Yeah. And that's the that's the thing is like you know, Carmen is usually the worst because like my older two now are at the point where um, they've expanded the capacity they've expanded the capacity but also they know my <laughs> tactics yeah and so they don't even bother asking right they like they know i know how dad works i know how far we're going and i know the likelihood of him stopping at some point and like i'm just gonna wait he's gonna stop and um yeah <laughs> but that's how you know my older two arbor carmen will ask she'll be like hey um i gotta go I'm like is it a five or a ten where are you at what's what's your number of like you know weight versus damage versus like anxiety here <laughs> and one of the things is like you know occasionally i'll ask that and i'll hear like is that a seven now just like quietly is that a seven, is that a seven? <laughs> um and moving to an eight it's <laughs> and i think one of the biggest things we need to do with like you know making sure we're prior to prioritizing our families keeping a good ear out to see where they're at mm -hmm. yeah. Because like, hey, um, are you holding together here? Or do, is there more time of you? Because like, one of the things that I've learned in just watching other good parents and stuff is that if a kid is asking you to do something with them, it's it's the, their version of I miss you. Please spend time with me. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it also helps to know the love language of your child as well. You have some kids that are quality time. Uh, some kids are words of affirmation. Uh, mm -hmm. And you just need to be able to because each of, of my kids will be different as far as you know the way that they receive love or what they would experience love from dad or time from dad. And so just being mindful of that, especially when you have multiple kids. Yeah. When, I, uh, when my kids were small, I wasn't a Christian. And Seth was three, so that meant the other ones were like five, six, seven, like that. And as I hear them talk about that time, um, I don't hear them talking about it being a bad thing, but it was always, especially Hillary, she'll say, we were the first to get the church and the last to leave. We'd close the doors. We'd be there with the custodian as he closed the doors, you know, making sure everything was done. She, we served. And, but we also played. They got to, they have sports. But the sport did not take precedence over serving. And that was a hard balance because they saw their friends uh, getting to do more as far as sports and activities mm -hmm. because we had church yeah. and that was a requirement you you go you're going to go to church you're going to serve but you still get your time but it had to be a balance it one couldn't outweigh the other mm -hmm. so they had to have time with friends they had to be socialized they they had to have those activities but they also needed to be at church they needed to be learning they needed to be serving and that was, um, wasn't a hard decision for me and my wife to make. It was just to get the balance. Yeah. It's like, okay, you can do this activity. You can't do three activities because that's going to interfere with Wednesday night Bible study, with youth group on Sunday evenings. You know, yeah, we, 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 were, we went to church a lot, you know, as they were kids. Mm -hmm. So it was not throwing the family under the bus for ministry or the ministry for the family. It had mm -hmm. to be a balance. Yeah. And, and as I look at the, my kids now who serve in church, that uh, attend church regularly, that I hope that I had that balance. Yeah. So as far as <clears throat> hearing from them, I don't hear from them that it wasn't a good balance. Mm -hmm. And Mike, I know we're talking a bunch about kids and stuff too, but you also <laughs> have people in your life that are like, you know, you actually, that are waiting on you as well. So, um, had, like you hear all of us talking about our family stuff and like that um 
but you have like a whole college campus that's like <laughs> waiting on you. Um, yeah. Well, have you seen any like balance stuff there, like with uh, how you work with college kids? Because you know, I know that college demand, college time is a demanding time, <coughs> um, and you know, college kids don't. I, I don't mean offense by saying college kids. It's just I've said that for like fifteen years. <laughs> no, I feel you. Um, college kids keep weird hours. Yeah, <laughs> and like that's its own thing. So, have you seen any specific demand balance issues? I think having the trying to understand that. I might have to take some breaks from that. Like, if it's in the middle of the day, it's okay because probably nighttime I'll be hearing from them. And um, being able to, to how would I say, schedule, put margin in my schedule and stuff like that. Um, I think the thing that kind of hinders me sometimes is I tend to either focus more on ministry and not make time for friends is where I might end up. I suck at that. Yeah. <laughs> and... Because once I'm done with ministry stuff, I'm like, I'm tired of people. Mm. And I want to just recoup. I want to just veg out. But that doesn't help with friendships. <laughs> so right. there's been moments where I've sacrificed friendships for the isolating part. Mm. And so, Well, I, I struggled with that a lot in the fact that I would pour so much into students in my college time frame that I stopped being able to believe that people were my friends. Yeah. And that, you know, people only saw me as a resource. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't, I was, I completely lost the ability to actually develop and nurture good friendships. And um, to the point where there was nobody that uh, was in my life that wasn't either blood or mm -hmm. like my ministry, my flock. Yeah. And so, which leaves you completely drained and alone when you're actually struggling with something yourself. And yeah. see, you gotta be, you gotta be able to learn to do that. Or I would find myself like investing in friendships that weren't healthy, <laughs> because unhealthy friendships usually have lamer boundaries. Right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, that's yeah. a it's a big thing with the balance and stuff. Um, so we looked at some of Abraham's faulty issues of how he threw his wife to the wolves um but <laughs> abraham also had a lot of good successful things that he modeled in his faith his faith was like a I, like reading through this just re past couple weeks preaching it um i felt like you know abraham had a lot of dory going on <laughs> and that like <coughs> you hear something you know what it is and then you forget it like five minutes later because there's a lot of abraham's story that is like here's here's what i'm telling you to do got it what did you say yeah. got it <laughs> do the wrong thing what'd you say got it and it's just that back and forth um there's a lot of but abraham did act in faith and you know as scripture tells us that his, him trusting the lord was credited to him as righteousness um so one of the first acts of faith we really saw Abraham do was to leave all of his comfort, leave all the stuff that he had built up for himself. Has there ever been a time uh, in your life or your ministry uh, where you've known God was calling you to leave something? Um, and how did you respond to that? Started Vertical Church. <laughs> <laughs> Plug. Left yeah. Pembroke last year. Was, left Pembroke last year. Yeah, I, I left Galilee Baptist Church to do an internship, with with, and struggled uh, with that for a year or longer, yeah. um, and I struggled on my own. I, I, and I apologize to my family and my wife especially for not sharing that struggle, but uh, I just knew God was calling me to something, and I didn't want to leave because I enjoyed my church. I, I taught Sunday school. I, uh, help lead a youth group. We did missions work. It was just like, I like this. This is yeah. what I thought you wanted me to do, God. And but he's like, yeah, but there's something else I want you to do, mm -hmm. and you got to leave that. You got to stop that. Well, that church doesn't have Sunday school. It doesn't do this. It doesn't do that. Well, but I need you to go do this. And that was a struggle. And I tell people every <laughs> so many times at 3 a.m. There's must be something about three o'clock. I've heard other people talk about 3 a.m. in the morning, you wake up, and God's talking to you. And he's talked to me through his word. He he's in a different time zone. Scripture. <laughs> you know, scripture would just God's come to my mind about how he's leading me to do this. 
And, and when I finally did start talking about it, it's like, I know i got to go do this internship, but I don't know where it's going to lead. Mm-hmm. Just like Abraham was going, yeah. I need you to go to the promised land. Mm-hmm. And then when we got there, it was a famine. It was like, God, is that really where you wanted me? Well, let me go check this out, you know, and I'll come back to this. And that's kind of where I was with this internship. And it was like, okay, I finished my internship. Now what, God? So I'm just like, yeah. and then yeah. all of a sudden, you go back and look at the how things were put in place. Mike was getting this opportunity to go to the state convention at the end of my internship, all this then all of a sudden, oh, we, I don't see. Yeah. we yeah. call you to be this? Well, that was similar to me when I first went into the ministry. Uh, I was working as an engineer professionally. Um, and my, I felt God calling me, but I was like, all right, God, how are we going to do this? Because, like, I had a job that I loved. Um, how am I going to provide for my family? <laughs> what have I got to do about seminary? I uh, felt like seminary was a next step for me. How, how am I going to do that with a full-time job? So for me, it was a lot of questions. Like if I was in Abraham's boat, I would have been like, okay, God, so where are we going? How long is it going to take? How much is it going to cost? How long is it going to be there? Yep. Yep. And so I had those questions, and, and I had to finally get to the place where Abraham kind of started at, and that is, okay, I'm trusting you, God. And uh, because God was like, oh, well, I'm not showing you all the answers. Yeah. I mean, you just got to trust me. Mm-hmm. And uh, and it was a little bit easier making that step when I first went into ministry by the time I got to start Vertical Church because then I had I had grown. I had seen God's faithfulness. I mean, he provided me for me in miraculous ways. I mean, one of the things was how am I going to pay for seminary? Like, And so I remember going to my, my boss and being real nervous about telling him that I was going into the ministry because I was like, man, he could fire me. I mean, he could say, you know, clean out, you're done in two weeks or, you know, all of that. And so I went to him and I said, you know, I feel like God's calling me into this. He's like, well, I'm not surprised by that. I kind of saw that. Mm-hmm. And he was very gracious. He allowed me to go to seminary and he didn't even take any, I mean, he continued to pay me my full salary, wow. even though I took one day a week to go to seminary. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so it was like, okay, God's got this. And so when I got to start Vertical Church, you know, came with Pastor Mike to start Vertical Church, it was like, okay, God will provide. I don't know how, but we're going to step out and do this. And mm-hmm. once, I, once I discerned that, hey, this is God leading us, because of that first experience, which mm-hmm. we see with Abraham, yeah. I mean, because of his steps of faith, by the time he gets to Isaac and taking him up on the mountain to sacrifice him, Isaac doesn't miss a beat. I mean, Abraham doesn't miss a beat during that time. No hesitation. No hesitation because his faith had grown as he had seen God's faithfulness. And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, that's, so that was, that was my story. And, mm-hmm. But, yeah, those, those steps are huge. To, you got a lot of questions. You're like, okay, how's, how's this going to work? And I kind of went through the same thing when I stepped away from school to do an internship here. And... Uh, and I was with but the lesson to take away from this is if you do an internship here, you're probably going to yeah. end up working. <laughs> yeah. But, but, but I took that step of, from the internship, and then I was like in Tim's book, like, okay, what's, what's happened after the internship? And then the transition happened. And then last year when we were praying through, you know, with Bladen, and I feel like God was like, hey, listen, here goes the next step. The question started arising of, what does that even look like? Because I'm not from there and then all that. But the this, I think what you said a while ago, after going through it one time, the second time was a little bit easier. Like when he, when I felt like he was saying, "Okay, this is what I need you to do," I really didn't question the move. Right. I Once you knew it was God, you yeah. I questioned what was it going to look like. Yeah. Which was didn't happen till after I moved. Right. You know, well, that's how God works. Like, yeah. Does. So I was like, so think about Abraham. I mean, so every step he's taken, he's stepping out where God says, but he doesn't know what the next step after that is. Right. Mm-hmm. Which is hard for our yeah, our human yeah. minds to because we like, especially for those of us who like to have a plan, and <laughs> yeah. uh, we, we've got to have we got to have it all who's mapped my out. Team? Who's yeah. my team? How you know? How's all? What are all the details? Yeah. But you know, if you think about it, if God actually gave you all the details, I think it would probably freak us out. Oh God. Yeah. Like, even starting Vertical Church, if God had told me all of what we were going to do and how, I, I, I probably wouldn't have done it. I, it was pretty, pretty scary, some stuff. Like, I don't want to go through that, Lord. Like, like yeah. okay, if you do this and then when you'll get into a building, there's going to be a flood. I mean, like, if you knew all that stuff, you wouldn't do it. Yeah. 
I wouldn't do it. So I'd just, be like, no, I'll just wait till the flood's over. The comfort zone thing. Like, <laughs> I want to stay in the comfort zone. I don't want to go through all that. That yeah. sounds like a lot of work. <clears throat> I didn't want to do support raising coming out of college. <laughs> <laughs> right? Oh yeah. my gosh. Well, okay. Like, and that's one of the things too, is like, uh, I, I, I do not, before I say this out loud, I'm not going anywhere and I do not feel called <coughs> for ministry at this time. Um, <laughs> just, just before this says this. Um, but like, there's another ministry that I've always loved. Um, you know, Ground Zero in Myrtle Beach. I've yeah. always loved that ministry. But you've told us before. Uh, I've told you before. Um, <laughs> And uh, there was, uh, I went to, I went there sometime last year for something, and uh, Clint uh, had, at, our former youth minister, uh, had asked me, he's like, saw you were at Ground Zero a good bit lately. You leaving? And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like no. I'm like, I, God's not led me to, but like one of the main thi like, things I've told myself is like, I, I'm not even listening for God to tell me to go there because I don't want to have to raise money again. I don't want to have to support raise again. That's like I don't want to do that. Um, you know, somebody done that. Yeah. somebody asked me if I was going to go back on staff at Camp Grace, and I'm just like, I don't want to raise money again. And that's just my flesh saying, no, I don't. I don't want to do inconvenient things. But when the reality is, if we know yeah. all the steps of how hard is what you said, if we know how hard things are going to be, we don't want to do that. It's just like, okay. You know, one step at a time and I think God is merciful to us in this because yeah. if you would have told if God would have even laid out Abraham's plan good night yeah for real uh, <laughs> like do you think he's like hey I'm going to make you a, a father of many nations but all this drama is going to happen yeah right and two he's like the well and that you're going to have to wait 25 years like the, I think that's a game changer. I'm yeah, thinking yeah, yeah. Abraham is probably like us when God tells us okay God's getting ready to do it right now yeah yeah at least a month or yeah. at least a month, or a <laughs> yeah. couple of weeks, but like twenty-five years? What? Yeah. I don't you got know? time, Lord. Yeah. I'm I always took all that for twenty-five years of waiting. I, I've, I've kind of described it sometimes as is a that cloud, cloud shrouded staircase. Yeah. And you can't see the next step, mm -hmm. and it may be up or down. Kind of like driving in the mm -hmm. fog. Yeah. yeah. But you won't know you whether right you're going up or down until you make the next step. Yeah. And and whether it's up or down, you you've got to trust it. God has placed those steps. He's guiding my steps. Mm -hmm. He's laid that path before me, even though it's shrouded to my human vision. Yeah. And like you said, when you take the first one, you go, oh, okay, cool. Mm. The next one's easier. And then the next yeah. one's easier. Yeah. Yeah. But that first step. <laughs> that first report, man. It's a doozy. Um, so taking that step, one of, the, one of the things that I noticed, you know, this is just one of the things we picked up in our small group this week, too, was that when... All right, those angels showed up at Lot's house. Mm. This is still in Abraham's family. Um, the <coughs> angels showed up at Lot's house, said, hey, this place is about to get real hot. Get out. Um, and, but if you notice, if you read through the scripture there, um, Lot lingered. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, yeah. And they couldn't make it as far as they needed to go because Lot lingered when God said, get out. Has there ever been times on the other end where you've lingered when you should have gone and you've seen maybe some aftermath of that or some negative outcome out of that? I don't know, man. I'm, I'm scared of God. <laughs> Fair. Uh, I think he's, I think when he I says go, you better go or you're going to regret it. I mean, you know, that's kind of, um, you know, he's gracious and he understands our understanding and our, and our wavering faith, but, um, I just fear the Lord. I don't, um, I don't think I. I feel like I've tried to to step, mm. and he says go. Um, I don't. I know what happened with Lot and his family, and I was like, eh, oh, I don't want none of that. I don't want none of that mojo. Mm. Well, that's I, what I, I was telling our small group was that um, I have one instance early on in my ministry where I knew God told me to go, mm. and I didn't. And it literally felt like I got windmill kicked in the face with all the outcome <laughs> that came after it. And so, like, for every other instance that's happened in ministry yeah. since then, right. if I felt God say go, I'm out. Yeah. I, I've had the instance of God telling me don't go. And that sounds weird, but when we had the New York trip, yeah. and <laughs> I was like, man, I want to go to New York. And it was like, I was like, I don't need you to go to New York. You know, not, and you came to me that day on the sidewalk before I went to Mike and Donnie about it, and they were like, Hater was like, Listen, man, every great opportunity is not a God opportunity. 
And if he's telling you to stay, you need to stay, you know. But I think even then, if I would have went to New York, I don't know where I would be personally. Because that was a huge – that was hard for me to not go when I wanted to, you know. Maybe you're going for the wrong reasons. Yeah. I wanted to go. No, I wanted to go for the wrong reasons. Yeah. Well, it's, it was also just the not uh, not a negative about you. And then it was just – we were all like – when you get left out of something big, yeah. you want to show up just because it's it says about who you are, mm-hmm. and the fact that you would leave me behind is like, well, what does that say about me? Yeah. Um, but that and that's one of those things too is like when we linger, we're asking for we're asking for God to, to be outside of that protective space, and I want to be under the umbrella. So what was, if there's one lesson you feel like you learned predominantly, um, Ooh, DJ and your wife Tim slash your daughter um, says uh, <laughs> says favor doesn't follow disobedience. Mm-hmm. Amen. And um, that's exactly right. We've been there. You've been there. <laughs> Sounds like she knows Jesus. Um, <laughs> that's a life experience. So, <laughs> so out of out of the whole time of what we've just in the past couple of weeks of preaching through Abraham and reading through this with our small groups and stuff and the Bible reading plans, um, what's one thing that you took away personally? from Abraham's journey for your life? I know for me, um, Mike was preaching at Bladen uh, the other week about it, but, and I've read this a couple of times, but never really stopped to think about it. Like after Abraham did all that he did with the failure and then started following God and failed again and whatever, God came to him and was like, listen, like I'm your great protector. Like I'm going to protect you. I'm your shield of strength. And then he says, I'm your great reward. And that statement has stuck with me for weeks now because it's mm-hmm. like, even through my failure, like even through me following God and doing what I know that God's called me to do, regardless if my wavering faith or not, upon an umbrella of favor or not, yeah. <clears throat> he's my great reward. You know, like he was reminding Abraham, I don't know if he was reminding Abraham or if that was the first time he really told Abraham that. But it was a reminder to me, like, he was telling Abraham, listen, I'm everything that you need, everything that you're going to need. Uh, Even when you didn't see it, I was everything you needed. And that was just, I mean, it just stopped me in my tracks when he said that that Sunday. Because Mike was like, that's the first time he had read it. And I was like, you know. And I think from what I really took away from it, though, not that, was there's so much, I think, during this little series we've been through, when you read something so many times you've overlooked some small things you know and sometimes for me i'm learning you know like now i'm learning how to just slow down when i'm reading and pay attention with fresh eyes yeah get with a fresh spirit don't so, just assume you already know the story yeah which is so hard read it like you're reading <clears throat> it the first time it is really hard yeah, yeah, me yeah. Too, I was talking about this one <laughs> something that kind of got got it for me was you know we see all these situations um where god blessed these people like Job he, he went through what he went through and then he blessed him with the things of this world again money you know uh, all the animals he got his kids with he you know started a whole new family and I personally kind of had gotten called up to well if I'm I'm really favored by God then those are the things that's going to show up mm-hmm. <clears throat> I'm not going to worry about how am I going to pay the bills because that'll be provided and, and looking forward to that it's really scary mm-hmm. but looking back going oh that's when you did that mm-hmm. that's when you did that um, I'm able to be in full time ministry because I don't have a full time job because I went through a time where I'm disabled and then I went through a time of no resources to teach me how to appreciate my resources mm-hmm. that God had provided. Mm. And then to use those resources now to say, I can work in full-time ministry and not have a need. 
all my needs are met. <clears throat> well, how did he meet those needs? I go back 20 years and go, oh, mm -hmm. that's how this came to be. Oh. And that's where I get from Abraham is talking about those steps of faith. When he knew that he put a knife in his son's chest, he was the son of promise. God had made that promise. He would bring him back to life and it would continue on no matter what happened. Mm -hmm. That's where he got to. I'm not there yet, mm -hmm. but I can see the steps when I look back on how I can get there. Mm -hmm. Mm. For me, um, we had a conversation last night in our group because you know some people are looking at the saying, man, Abraham, even though he had faith, like he was, he was kind of jacked up. <laughs> yep. um, and and people, as they're reading the Old Testament, they're like, man, I don't like the people that I'm reading in the Old Testament. I like some of the things that are going on in the Old Testament. And then I just, I, once they had all our discussion, I got to the end, I said, now let me ask y'all a question. I said, how would your life be right now if you had no Holy Spirit and you had no Word of God? How would your life be? I said, that's what those guys were facing. Mm -hmm. God was speaking to them. He was revealing himself to them, but they had no written word. Mm -hmm. They had no Holy Spirit, like we have access to the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. I said, so imagine what your life would have been like. So let's give them a little slack. Let's cut them a little credit. And I've just grown to appreciate the, the word of God and the fact that, uh, and, and, and the more I think about it, the more I'm like, you know, I, I need the Word of God. I, I, and I need not to take it for granted. And just because I've read yeah. through the Bible several times, I, or, you know, you yeah. get used to the stories, mm -hmm. and do not ever take the Word of God for granted because it's such a powerful resource that we have access to. And we've got the full revelation of God's Word to us regarding mm -hmm. redemption. Mm -hmm. And, and, and we, need to, we need to know it front ways, back ways, sideways, and upside down ways. <laughs> and uh, so for me, um, that was just a, a revelation that kind of came last night as everybody was talking. And, you know, we're, some people, I think David Hester was hating on Abraham a little bit. He's like, man, I don't really want to model Abraham. I'm like, <laughs> right. I can see that. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, you know, he was kind of a jacked up dude. Yeah. I, was, I heard somebody, I was a Christian comedian one time doing Father Abraham. Father Abraham had many sons, and one of them he left abandoned because his wife told him to. <laughs> it's just like, oh, geez. Uh, what kind of husband are you? Um, but, yeah. <laughs> but no, that's the thing. And uh, how many of us have the Bible and still don't follow what it says? Yeah. And what would our, if, if people were to look at our lives retrospectively mm -hmm. in print mm. the way we look at theirs? Hmm. Would they be inspired? It would be a jacked up story. Right. It would be a very <laughs> like in a story. similar way to what you guys are saying. Like mm -hmm. the thing that's been sticking out to me is how these guys, like Abraham, Jacob, there, and Isaac, they're stated in the list of faith in Hebrews. Yeah. The <laughs> Hall of Faith. faith. That's the yeah. Hall, Hall of Fame of Faith, man. <laughs> and like Hall of Fame God, inductees. God used them, so He can still continue using me, even in my jacked upness. Yeah. And like an encouragement of like, don't don't quit, just keep pressing forward. Keep pressing. Mm -hmm. Keep working. But, but even in the New Testament with the disciples. Oh, yeah, them too. I mean, <laughs> those guys changed the world. The tag band. And, and, and look what they, I mean, they were, yeah, they were screwed up, man. I mean, they were just misfits, people. Man. They were just people. And, that's, and people are like that. I mean, we are like that. True that. True that. I'm glad that we in that, that this past sermon, uh, just preaching it, and uh, credit to, I think, I, I love the sermon, but we made the point that God just doesn't just see the heart that exists right now. He knows mm -hmm. the heart to come. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's you know, Hector had made in, yeah, in our sermon plan. But that, was, dude, yeah. that they're just like, I mean, that captivates these yes. guys because, yeah, yeah they're, they're jacked up. But he God also sees knows. the potential, yeah. which is, by the way, how we need to look at the people that we lead. Yeah. yeah. Right, see mm -hmm. the potential in them. Call that potential out. The mm -hmm. we, I see in you conversations, right? Yeah. Well, was it Jesus saying that there to the people in the Sermon on the Mount, you're like the light on top of the hill? These people, yeah, these like people he's calling out their yeah. potential. Yeah, right, yeah. right. We're gonna be light. How is that? Right. I think only God was light. Mm. Yeah, it's good. All right. Well, that's all I really got for the day. Um, and thank you all for joining in. Thank you all that listen. Um, oh, hold on. Danielle, come in. Uh, 
Daniel said, uh, reading the journey that Abraham took and funny that you mentioned Job, it's easy to see all that they went through than God blessing them. When the reality is God was blessing the whole time. Mm, yeah. It is Ooh. the discipline that he show it is in discipline that he shows love without that struggle, without that test of faith, without that withdrawal. Um, there's no way that as people, as human as we are, to fully receive the gift of God. Mm. His presence Shh. through it all is mm. in the blessing. She be throwing some fire. Oh, who's who's invite her to uh, that was Dan. Put, uh, oh. Uh, damn, yeah, yeah. <laughs> by her, let's put her on camera. Yeah. Hey, we got she needs to do vision right here. What are you talking about? <laughs> well, I already asked her to like take wow. over my small group when I go over to Wizard of Oz. Wow, so that's, right there. Um, that's encouraging. That's cut deep. Yeah, that, that he was there through the whole thing. Cut yeah, yeah, yeah. Cutthroat of encouragement. <laughs> Double edged sword, there, man. Whew. Um, all right, so uh, thank y'all for listening. Uh, if you want to, if you're uh, watching this on Facebook and you want to listen to it later, it'll be on the church podcast on the app a little bit later um thank y'all for sharing thank y'all for encouraging and just want to just thank y'all for uh being part of the journey if you're uh reading through the bible with us mm. uh keep going if you haven't been reading through the bible with us Start jump in yeah. Yeah. It's um, not too late um, just there, get started <laughs> there are small groups available at all three locations yep. as well as an online one online option and um uh danielle says encouraging cutthroat sounds like a t-shirt idea um, <laughs> oh, dude, it could look like um, she's spitting fire today. Like if it had look, look like a blood stain running down and making oh, the shape of a yeah. heart. <laughs> yes, that's gruesome. Thank you. So start, beautiful. Start Thank creating, you. Hector. Yeah, I'll start making it. All right. Um, God bless y'all. We love y'all, and have a great day. I'm gonna run over to this camera. <laughs> <laughs> short legs. With my short legs.